All right, so last week we started a brand new collection of talks on the book of Colossians, and we gave you this gift of this little Colossians journal, and if you didn't grab one today, we have them on the table as you leave, or we'll have them at Connect Corner, where you can come hang out and meet some of our team. I'll be back there today after service. I'd love to meet you and hear your story, but we want to give you this because we know that our faith journey is more than just Sunday mornings. Our faith journey is more than just an hour on a Sunday morning. It's a Monday through Saturday thing that we need in our life that needs to be encouraged and built up. And so we wanted to give you during this collection of talks is this little journal that you can begin to just download some things and write some things down of what God is doing in your life as you read his word. So if you open the front page, if you just got one today, there's a little QR code, once again, quick response code, that you can scan, and it's going to lead you to a, a devotional that we created for, this, for these talks just for you, a devotional that you can walk through that gives you prompts in your journal. It's also the devotional that all of our circles are going through right now as well, and it's been really great just in the first few weeks. Last week, one of the big things I, I wanted to remind you of is these simple words about what the book of Colossians is reminding us or encouraging us in. It's that Jesus is in me, and that changes everything. Jesus is in me, and that changes everything. So I'm excited to step in to week two of this collection of talks. I'm excited to really open up God's word again and hear what he has to say. But would you do me a favor? Would you... Do, uh, clap your hands and welcome everybody that's watching us for Local City Online today. So glad that you're with us, wherever you're watching from. I know a lot of people, even today, I met someone who is watching online and they're here today. That is the biggest win for us, and our team does such a great job figuring it out. If you're watching today or watching later, we're glad that you're with us and you're a part of our church too. But also, turn to the person that you're sitting next to you right now and tell them, hey, you look great today. You look great today, and I'm excited to be sitting next to you. Now, last week we unpacked why Colossians was written. We realized that Paul has had a very specific intent because what was happening with the church there was they were getting a little distracted. I don't know about you, but I'm a very easily distracted person. I was never diagnosed with ADD, but I'm pretty sure I have it just because of my attention span. It's the reason why if you ever watch things like movies or TV, you can pretty much count it out that the scene or shot changes like every three to five seconds because we can't focus on one thing for too long. We got to jump to the next thing or pay attention to what's happening new, what's the new next big thing. And I know that attention is very important and distraction is really one of the biggest things that can mess us up in our faith journey. And what's happening here, again, Paul wrote Colossians to the church in Colossae in in 62 AD, so around 30 years after Jesus has died and risen from the dead, churches are being planted all over the known world at that time, and Paul is one of the main church planters. And he's writing a letter to Colossians, the church there, because he had never been there, as we're going to see in some of the scripture that we're talking about. And what's going on is they're being distracted, they're being tempted by some things that are not the authentic, real gospel of what Jesus' life was all about. I think about it this way. I am someone that sometimes can be easily influenced by these things we call commercials. Now, I grew up with TV where you actually watch TV and commercials happen. Now, most of us have streaming services. There's not many commercials out there, but now streaming has become so popular, they need more money, so now every streaming service is adding ads in, right? And they've done the little thing again because we don't have a lot of attention. They add the little counter, you know, like whether it's a 15-second or 10-second or 30-second ad, right? But I remember growing up with commercials that there were a lot of thought put into, like, I remember when I was growing up, one of the big uh, commercials that, w- that existed was the MasterCard commercial, which was the idea of, hey, you spend tickets to take your son to a football game, you know, $200, you buy a hot dog and a hamburger, $15, but making a father, son, and, uh, making a father and son moment, priceless, right? Like, those are, you know, some of them would make you cry. It was like priceless moments that they would detail out for you. It was great. And I remember the whole, like, got milk stuff where everybody had the little milk mustache. I don't like milk, but even those ads made me want milk. Like, I know there's people in here that you're like, yeah, I have a glass of milk every day. Gross. Like, do you pour cereal in it? Because, like, I don't know why people enjoy it, but those ads were a big deal. You know, I remember the Yokiro Taco Bell dog, and that was one that really influenced me. Because when I see a food commercial, I immediately want that. That, right? Like right now, you're like, hey, we should get Taco Bell on the way home after church, right? Just because I mentioned it. I don't usually talk about Chick-fil-A on Sundays because I don't want to tempt you because you can't get it on the way home. But I'm influenced by these commercials. I'm swayed by things that grab my attention. 
Again, Amazon, the Amazon Prime Day, I think, is tomorrow or this week. Already I've been looking at the deals like, okay, what do I not need? But there, it's on, I can save some money on even though I don't even need it, right? We're distracted by those things because we think we need it or we're tempted to want it or have it. And that's what's happening in this church in Coloss- uh, to the church of Colossians right now. They are tempted with things that they think they need. They are tempted with philosophies and arguments and teachings that are exactly opposite of Jesus. And Paul is saying, nope, that's not what this is about. The title I would love for you to write down in your journals this morning and write down if you're watching from home is From a Place of Love. And this details out a lot of the book of Colossians. So number one, Paul writes the book of Colossians from the physical place of prison. He's been placed in prison for teaching people about Jesus, for planting churches, but he didn't let that stop him. I encouraged you last week, maybe you feel like you're in a prison right now, whether it's emotional, spiritual, financial, relational, whatever it is. You do not have to wait until you get out of that prison for God to do something in your life and through your life. You don't have to wait until you're out of that prison to where God can speak to you. He can speak to you right now and encourage you and lift you up, and you can do something that makes a difference. It's what Paul resolved to do. So he writes this book of Colossians that we are still reading much, much later on. But not only the place of prison does he write it, but he writes it from a place of love. And you're going to see that in his words that he writes and puts on paper in just a few moments. But today I want to gift you the place of love in your life. Like where is the place we go back to? Where is the place of love in our life where we find who we are? We find our identity, we find our value, and everything that makes up this life that we're living. Where is our place of love? Because that is the place we live from. That is the place that we find who we are from. Because it's been gifted to us from God. Here's what it says in Colossians chapter two, starting in verse one. It says, this is Paul's words, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea. And for many other believers who have never met me personally. That's why I love Paul. Because he always starts his letters out saying, I'm, I'm agonizing for you because I care about you so much. Last time I checked, agony is not a good thing. But Paul is saying that's what he's in right now because he's been praying for this church. He's been praying for its people. And for many other believers who I have never even met. Paul knows that the church in in Colossae needs to understand that even though he's never met them, they have the same Jesus with them, the same God is on their side that is living and moving in and through their lives and in and through their church. He says, I want them to be encouraged. It's our goal for you today, to be encouraged in who you are and who God says you are, knit together by the strong ties of love. And I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. How many of you guys, when you're watching a movie or watching a show or reading a book, you love like a good twist ending? Anybody out there? Anyone? All right. Anyone really good at calling the twist? Anybody? All right. I, I, I sometimes, you know, I still say, you know, in the sixth sense, even though it was spoiled for me, I knew Bruce Willis was dead. I just knew it. If you haven't seen that movie, I just ruined it for you. Sorry. But it's been like 25 years, so it's not my fault. Uh, but the thing is, we love when we don't see something coming, right? With the mystery. Some of us love the mystery of figuring something out, the mystery of a story or of something that we're invested in. I want you to know this book that I have, the scripture, the word of God, it is not a mystery. And Paul literally says it right here. That you would understand God's mysterious plan, which isn't a mystery at all. It's Jesus Christ himself. If you want to know the answer to what you're going through or how to figure your way out, it's Jesus. If you want to know the meaning of life and why you're here, it's Jesus. To experience and have a relationship with the Son of God who has purchased your life, who has forgiven you and freed you. There's no mystery at all. It's Jesus. Not even spoiler alert because it's exciting to know. The mystery is Jesus, and he's here with us in this room today, and he's here in your life today. It's the invitation. But what does Paul continue to say? Let's finish it up, and then we'll get really going here. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you, and I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. Where I'm going to lean today is I'm telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. Now, let let me get a show of hands. How many of us love with all of our hearts being lied to? 
I can usually tell if someone's not paying attention at that moment because if they just see me raise their hand, they're like, oh, me. Oh, wait, not me. Right? We don't love being lied to. We don't love being deceived. No one says when they want to be friends with someone, hey, I'm going to be a great friend. I'm never going to tell you the truth. Like, that's not what we look for. And so Paul is saying there's people out there who are trying to deceive you, but I want to give you confidence today. And that's where I want our conversation to go this morning, is I want to give you confidence. Here's, and we're going to walk through chapter 2 of Colossians. Here's Paul's goal for this chapter. Three quick things. You can write them down if you want. It's that we want to help you live rooted in Christ, understanding that your roots can grow down deep into the person of Jesus, not in some sort of emotional success or religious performance or any other person besides the Son of God, to live rooted in Jesus, unswayed by a false gospel. Don't want you to be knocked over today. And also you can live from a place of abundance, abundant in faith. And let me give you two statements before I pray and we really jump into chapter two today for week two of Colossians, is that there is nothing more powerful than the death of Jesus Christ. Nothing more powerful than the death of Jesus has ever happened in history. It's the most powerful thing to witness the Son of God give his life for you and me, not only physically, but spiritually as well, as he took on all the sin and shame that I would ever do or experience so that I could be brought back into relationship with my Heavenly Father. I always want to encourage you to remember that today, that someone has given their life for you. And it's not just someone, it was the Son of God. Because the second statement is this, is that nothing more personal then the new life offered through the resurrection of Jesus exists. You want the most personal and powerful thing in your life? The most personal and powerful story? It's the fact that the Son of God, Jesus, laid down his life for me and for you and in three days walked out of that grave alive so that we could be made alive and so that we could have a personal relationship with him. That's the foundation we're building on. That is where we're going today. That is the only message that can change our lives. Would you pray with me today as we jump into the heart of our conversation? God, I'm so thankful for everyone here. I'm so thankful for what you're doing today. And God, we just listen and lean in to what you have to say. God, I'm so thankful for all of our amazing kids team members who are next door teaching our kids about the love of Jesus, and even at a young age, learning to experience you and know that, Jesus, you can be their very best friend. And Jesus, I pray that the Holy Spirit this morning would just, again, speak to us clearly as we write things down, as we pay attention to the conversation that we're having, that you would speak to us in a clear and powerful way. We love you, Lord. We trust you today. We thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, we all say, come on, give me a good amen if you're ready for where we're going this morning. Yeah, I love it, I love it. And so what I want to do today is give you four words. I know sometimes it's hard to remember what we talk about, but say someone asks you tomorrow at work, hey, what'd you talk about at church? You can give them these four words. It's follow-up, foundation, fullness, and a finished work. That's what I believe Paul is doing in chapter two, to a specific sense that's practical to us today is that four words that we can apply to our life, to specifically our faith journey, is to follow up, to have a foundation, to be fullness, and to see the finished work of Jesus, and understanding that there's nothing more powerful than these things. I love when things are super simple. I remember when I was at Florida State, I was originally an advertising major, until I realized that was not what I wanted to do. Uh, And God called me into the ministry, which is why I get to be here with you today. But I remember I was in advertising class my freshman year. And the first thing he said, the first lesson this advertising uh, professor gave was, hey, you got to understand that when it comes to advertising, when it comes to creative marketing, it's all about this method right here, and it's the KISS method. And I was like, oh, I thought this was advertising. Didn't know this was some sort of like romantic poetry class. He said, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. The KISS method is keep it simple, stupid. Now, I'm not, you know, I don't want to insult anyone, but sometimes that's the key for us, is to keep it simple, just to keep things simple in the way God has designed them, to not overcomplicate it, because when it comes to, again, advertising commercials, if you just watch a commercial and you have no idea what it was advertising to you, it would not have done its job. But when it keeps it simple and speaks to a need that you have, well, then there you go. And today, I want to keep it simple for you to realize these are kind of the four things we can build our faith around. And the first thing is to follow up. Now, speaking more than just the idea of maybe you've ever ever had someone try to sell you something before, 
whether it's a new insurance plan or whether it's some sort of new subscription or the solar people that stop by your house at any hour of the day to sell you solar roof stuff because it's free, and, but it's really not, right? And when you give your information to any sort of salesman, if he's good, the first thing he will say is, hey, when's a good time to follow up on this, right? When can I fo- follow up on what we talked about? Well, I think in our faith journey with Jesus, that's actually a very important thing to understand. It's because our life and faith with Jesus is not just about one moment, where we said yes to Jesus in our life, and that was it. It was not just, again, about one experience that we had. It's about a constant follow-up where Jesus wants an in-depth, intimate relationship with you and me, and he wants to follow up with us us on how life is going. That's what a relationship is all about. Look what it says in Colossians chapter 2. And now, just as you accepted Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him one of the first games you learn as a little kid. Follow the leader. And it was very easy to tell whether or not a kid was good at that game. If the leader was going through the playground, that's where we followed. If the leader was walking single file, that's where we followed. If the leader ran, we ran. If the leader walked or crawled, we did that. Because the game is called follow the leader, not follow the guy behind me. And I think in our life we have to understand that Jesus is leading us. He is guiding us. And he's right in front of us, helping us see where to go next and what to do. And for us, it's just about following up on that. So it says, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. I love this concept of overflowing with thankfulness. You want want to know one of the greatest practical tools you can have to stay encouraged and to stay in the game and stay invested in what God is doing, to overflow with thankfulness? Maybe a practice for you today before you go to sleep or before you start your day tomorrow is to get a blank piece of paper, maybe even in the journal that you were given, and just write down things, all the things that you're thankful for. I'm thankful for that. I'm alive today. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for our church. I'm thankful for a God who is with me and has never forgotten about me, and I've given, given him so many reasons to give up on me, and he never has. I'm thankful for the materials that I have, a car, a laundry machine, little practical blessings that we get to experience in our life. I always remember this story I heard a long time ago of a guy who was up on the top of a building, and he was going to jump because he thought his life was over. And they, of all people, they brought up a pastor to talk to the guy on the ledge. And the pastor just began to learn his name and talk to him. And he would, he would ask him, he started asking him questions. And I'm so sorry that what's happened in your life, I'm so sorry that maybe you've lost all your money. He says, no, no, plenty of money in the bank. I, you know, I've got a good job. Oh, well, I'm so sorry that maybe your family's left you. He's like, no, I've got a great family. I love my kids, love my wife. I'm so sorry that whatever's going on in your mind that would bring you to this place, that it would bring you up here. And he responds to things like, you know, I'm doing okay. I'm feeling good. And then the pastor asked him, then why are you up here? He said, I don't really know. And he came on down. And I think sometimes in our life, we think that all these things are going wrong, but when we really take a deep breath, and we think everything's going wrong, and it brings us to this ledge of decision, of giving up, whether it's on God or in our life or in our relationships, whatever it is, we're going to give up. When we really take a deep breath and someone begins to ask us questions and we let, it's not as bad as I thought. I have more than I thought. Things are better than I could even perceive sometimes. So what am I doing up here? I'm just going to continue to follow up on the things of God because I promise you sometimes the things we follow, whether it's our own thoughts, our own voices, the voices on social media or the news, those things begin to, we can follow them and they begin to lead us down. So I love this two, two phrases here of following up, that Jesus is the only person that we can follow who will bring us up in life to the things of heaven. Jesus is the only person that we can follow that will bring us up to who we were actually created to be. Everything is just either following us and they don't know where they're going or it's just leading us down and away from the things of God into more division and chaos and hate and hurt for the person around us. Jesus is the only one that says, hey, follow me up to something that is bigger and better than you could possibly imagine. Follow me up to realize who you were actually created to be and what it actually means to experience this life. Follow me up so you can begin to see the son and daughter that you were created to be. 
I know it may not always be easy. Jesus understands that it may be difficult and uncomfortable sometimes to follow him, but when you know him more personally, that he is your best friend that is full of hope, love, and joy, forgiveness, and a new life for you, you are going to follow him anywhere because you know that he saved you from the pits of hell, he rescued you from darkness, and placed you in his kingdom. So once again, one of the best prayers I can pray is wherever you go, Jesus, I want to follow because where else would I be without you? Yeah, we can celebrate that because that's good today. It's encouraging me. It's encouraging you. Follow up with your faith. Paul is saying, continue to do this thing. Don't give up. I hear him to tell you it's not going to be easy, but it is worth it every step of the way. The second thing is, or I, I, I'm going to give you a question for each of these words. So the question I want you to write down under follow-up is, what are you following? Could you truly say I'm following Jesus, that I see where he's taking me? Or are we following the voices of other things? Are we following ourselves, our own comfort? What are we following? Because I promise you, whatever you're following, it's not too profound, but whatever you're following is where you're going to end up. Whatever you're following is where you're going to end up. I remember hearing a story from someone in our church where they had moved up north. This is a church I worked at a while ago. Uh, they had moved up north, and they had never driven at night in the snow before. And they were leaving their, their, uh, their, their office, and they had no idea where to go. And so all they did was just get behind someone and follow their brake lights, follow their, their behind them as close as they possibly could. And they were, you know, I don't know if you've ever driven in snow I have, I hate it. And it's, you know, you get, over, you get all over the wheel, like trying to see and going as slow as possible. And they're doing that. They're following just the lights right in front of them and thinking they know where they're going. And they're following them so closely that they follow them through each turn, left turn. And I don't know where we're going, but we're just going to keep following this person because I want to stay safe. And suddenly the lights go off and they rear end this person. And that person had just stopped in their garage. And they followed them all the way to their garage and they rear ended this person and they ran into the wall in their garage, all because they had no idea who they were following. Imagine you're the person in front of them. You're like, why is this person following us into our house? What are they doing? See, when we're following someone that we don't know where they're going, we can, it can lead to destruction. When we follow someone that we know that cares for us and loves us and has our best interests at heart, not even best interests, but the best thing possible for us, we're going to follow them closely. Because the temptation in, in Colossae right now with this church was to drift away from who Jesus was. And that's the next thing I want to give you, is foundation. We all have a foundation we're building our life on. And Paul knew this. Colossians chapter 2, he says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies. I love this phrase right here. And high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. I don't know about you, but I do love the blessing sometimes that is our social media and updated news life that we have. But I honestly believe a lot of times it's just high-sounding nonsense. Like sometimes it's, it's high because they sound like they know what they're talking about. Sometimes it's high because they... Sound high, like what are you talking about? This is not working, this is nonsense. We have to be able to have that filter in our mind of saying, you know what, this is nonsense. If anything goes against what Jesus has demonstrated in his life, it's nonsense. If anything goes against the life that God has created us to follow, it will not help us, it will not sustain us, it will not save us. Empty philosophies, some of these things are gonna sound good, it sound like it makes sense, but when it's going to lead to emptiness, it's going to hurt. It's going to be a hard fall. The only thing that's filled with divine wisdom and power is the words of Jesus and the words of Scripture that we're reading right now. Every building has one thing in common, and it's a foundation. It's one of the most famous parables. The wise man built his house on the rock. The foolish man built his house on the sand. It was old, old song, and the rains came tumbling down, right? If you, ever, if you grew up in church. And the thing is, when the rains come tumbling down, if your foundation is sand, it crumbles. Because life has a lot of rain. It still has storms. When those things start coming down and your foundation is on the rock, and we know, again, like hope, the rock has a name, and that name is Jesus, we can stand. 
Because even though things might get torn down, the foundation is never lost. And I want to encourage you, if your foundation is Jesus, it doesn't matter what your past or mistakes or people, it does not matter what gets destroyed in your life. If your foundation is Jesus, I promise you, it can always be restored and rebuilt back to what it be, to better than it ever was before. But it starts with the foundation. Maybe sometimes it's God chiseling away some things and tearing some things down that we don't need anymore because he's gonna rebuild something better than we could possibly even imagine. So our foundation has to be Jesus. I love the root word of this, found, foundation. When life is going crazy, when life gets you down, when you feel defeated, when you feel disregarded, when you feel alone, where will you be found? Will you be found on the foundation of Jesus or have we created foundations out of our insecurities, our anxieties over the empty philosophies of the world? Or will we be found on the foundation of Jesus? That's my question for you today. Where is your foundation? Because what was happening here with the, with the Colossian church is that they were being distracted away from Jesus. I told you last week, there was this group of people called the Gnostics. Gnosticism was this philosophy that was moving that everything was up here. You just gotta know the right answer. And it's a secret knowledge that only a select few people have. And God is not interested in your life at all. In fact, he created this world and left it and wants nothing to do with it because it's broken and messed up unless you have the secret knowledge. Secret password, I don't know. But the thing is, is that's not what life is about because that takes all the relationship out of it. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies or high-sounding nonsense. I don't want that to happen to you. I want you to be rooted and grounded in the foundation of Jesus in your life. I want you to be rooted and grounded in the person of Jesus. Because here's a, I've been, each week I've been encouraging you to look at some of the Greek words that we see. And there's a Greek word in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, that Paul uses called sokeia. I think it'll be up on the screen for you so you can learn how to spell it. <laughs> But this Greek word means elements. And what Paul was talking about refers to a Jewish tradition that says spiritual beings rule over humans. Paul debunks the myth that spiritual forces have any power over Christians. I need you to understand today that when your foundation is Jesus, the spiritual powers of things like fear and insecurity and anxiety and depression, the spiritual things that really attack your spirit don't have power over you anymore doesn't mean that we don't deal with them, but they all surrender and bow to the name of Jesus. There's evil forces at work in our world, and sometimes it can get overwhelming, but those elements, those things have to bow to the name of Jesus, and they cannot break the foundation of Jesus. They can pound away all they want. They will never break it, and when our life is built on that foundation, that we may be pressed down, we may be persecuted, we may be crushed, but we are never abandoned. We are never destroyed because our foundation is built on Jesus. Let me give you the last two real quick. Number three is fullness. Fullness. Colossians 2, 9 and 10. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Jesus Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. Let me take a deep breath and give you some freedom over the reason why I don't get stressed out about the political spectrum in our world right now. Because they are not the person I'm looking to for answers. They are not the people I am looking to for help. They are not the person that my life is built on. They are not the voice that my fullness of existence comes from. It says Jesus is the head over every ruler and every authority. I don't mean that we as a church take a back seat to everything we serve and help and try to make a difference the best way that we can to keep people aligned with the word of God. But I promise you, I'm just gonna be real with you, I am never discouraged by what I hear on the news. I am never discouraged by the chaos and stuff that I see, by the hatred, because I know all of that has no power over the name of Jesus. So as long as I'm filled with the voice and words of Jesus, none of that stuff has any place in my life. I live full of joy and full of hope, not because I'm so great. I'm not a great, I'm not the great person all the time. I've made a lot of mistakes, but Jesus is great. And I made a decision a long time ago to surrender my life to him and empty myself of everything else and fill my life and my spirit and my soul with the peace and hope and joy that he offers. When you're full of those things, nothing else can get in. 
When you're full of the goodness of Jesus and the goodness of God, nothing else can begin to seep in. And that's what Paul is trying to remind the Colossians about. Don't let any of this stuff come in. Because it takes time, but one day you will be full of the power and love of Jesus, and none of those other things will have a voice anymore. I got to have an amazing experience this past Tuesday uh, with my son Shepard. He's off school uh, for the whole week. He was off school for the whole week of July 4th. And that means we get to have some great fun days with him, and we always love creating memories. And I wanted to create a memory with him, just me and him, where we went to, our, I took him to, my, to his first ever movie. We went to the movie theater. Here's a picture of him in the movie theater, looking so excited. He's eating his hot dog right there, that I'm being a good dad and holding for him so he doesn't get ketchup all over himself. But I love the movie theater. I love the first time I went with my dad a long time ago. Now, I took, a much more, I took my son to a much more age-appropriate film. The first movie my dad took me to, I was five years old, and I wanted to go see Jurassic Park, so my dad took me. Uh, didn't sleep for a couple nights after that, but it's okay. I love it now as an adult. Uh, just a little bit of you know, fear that I still deal with. No, I'm just kidding. But with Shepard, I took him to see the Minions movie because he loves Gru and he loves the Despicable Me movies and all that. Super fun. Uh, at, my, at one point, I was like, okay, I'm ready for this to be over with. But I looked over, and he was smiling, and he was really excited, and he loved it. Sat in his little seat the whole time. It helps that they have those like recliners now that he can like, push the buttons and move up and down, and that was really fun. But one of the things that I didn't expect was a problem. I didn't expect it was going to be a problem arose like at the very beginning of the experience. So we walk in and we're sitting there. He's eating his hot dog. We're having a good time. And he's getting excited about the movie. And I told him, buddy, when the lights go down and they turn the volume up, that's when the movie's going to start. It's going to be great. It's going to be excited. So I, I got him all prepped and got him all ready. And that happens. The lights go down and the sound comes up. And he's like, the movie's starting. I'm like, yeah, buddy, let's go. Now, I've been, been to so many movies in my life. This next few minutes, totally, I was, it's totally like second nature to me, but a first for Shepard. The trailers start playing. And his first reaction is like, this isn't Gru. Where's Gru? I'm like, I know, I know, buddy, it's just a trailer. We got to sit and watch through this for a movie that's coming out. He's like, oh, okay. And so then, you know, nowadays there's like four or five trailers, so you're sitting there for 30 minutes before the movie starts. And so every time that a new trailer came up, Shepard's reaction was, that's not Gru. That's not why, I work, why we came. Where are the minions? I'm like, Shepard, just wait. They're coming. They're coming, buddy. And then finally, you know, the movie started. The minions show up and do their little annoying sounds. And Shepard's like, yeah. I'm like, yes, finally. <laughs> but I think in a really more serious sense, I think some of us in our life, this happens. That we're sitting in church, we're sitting in our relationship with God, we're reading, our, reading God's word, we're spending time in worship, and things begin to play out in front of us that aren't what we expected. We're like, where's my thing? Where was, where's what I came for? And God's like, would you just be, would you be patient? It's coming. You just got to sit through some things first. Maybe, maybe the trailers that are showing in front of you is God saying, hey, I know I got some great things for you but you gotta make church a priority again. I got some things for you, but I want you to see through this trailer of what's possible when you find that personal prayer life and time in my word again. I know you want, I know you want what I can do for you, but you gotta get in community. You can't do this on your own. I know, I know there's some things that you need provision and, and you have a lot of needs right now, but you're living like this. And I just gotta show you what's possible when you live like this. And I promise you, if you're patient and you wait and you listen to the voice of your father saying, just wait, it's coming. But don't get up and leave. Don't give up, it's coming. That's how you get full. Because fullness doesn't happen just like that. You have to have an empty vessel that you place under the spout and it pours in and in and in. And eventually we overflow. And how is this all possible? Well, the question I would really ask you today before we close is what are you filling with? Because if I have an empty glass, if I put it under water, that's what's going in. If I put it under something that's impure, poisonous to me, that's what's going in. Whatever I, whatever I place my life under to fill me is what I'm gonna be filled with. And whatever I get filled with is what's gonna come out. So are we filling ourselves with the things of Jesus, the words of his gospel message. Because I love what it says in Colossians chapter 2. If you throw that book up on the screen for me. Underneath the idea of fullness. 
tells us that you're dead because of our sins. You go back to for me. No, no, back. <laughs> you got it right the first time. You're dead because of our sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. But then God made you alive. For he forgave all your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against you and took it away by nailing it to the cross. And in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over the cross. I want you to know this, that Jesus took all that stuff, said all the, all the evils, all the hurts, all the shames, all the problems. And I love that it says he displayed them publicly and said, these things have no power over my people anymore. These things have no power over my followers anymore. They are not gonna be full of these evils, of this darkness, of this hurt, of this pain. They are going to be full of the forgiveness and freedom and power that is now available to them because the Son of God is giving his life. So remember the four things. It was following up, to continue to follow Jesus, build a good foundation, fill yourself with the things of God. And the last one, it's all possible because of a finished work. Finished work. I love what it says in Colossians 2, you were made alive. It's finished. So the question I wanted to leave you with today is Jesus accomplished everything on the cross for you and me. He conquered death. And Paul is trying to remind the Colossians that even though you are tempted by these outside philosophies, by these Gnostic teachings, you have to understand this. It's finished. The last thing Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. So I would encourage you to write this down today as we close. How hard are you working for things Jesus already gave you? How hard are you working for forgiveness? How hard are you working for acceptance? How hard are you working for value and significance and success? How hard are you working for relationships? How hard are you working for the things that you want? See, Jesus has given you those things already. He's given you purpose. He's given you value. You were created with it. He's given you forgiveness and freedom. That's why he gave his life for you. He's given you power. He's given you strength when he walked out of that grave alive. And he's given you a close friend who can understand this life better than you could possibly think or imagine. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna put up one more verse on the screen. Here's how we're gonna close. We're just gonna close with, I wanna pray this verse over you today. And we're gonna sing a song, but we're just gonna close here. I want to pray this verse over your life. Here's what it says in Colossians 2, 12. For you were buried with Jesus when you were baptized. And with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. I want you to know the old has gone and the new has come. You've been raised to new life from a place of love, from a place of love on the cross to the place of love today at local city church in July 2022 you still have that place and you still have access to God. Would you bow your heads and close right with me as we close today? Father, I'm so thankful that you've given us a place that we can always return to. That you've given us a place that we can always run to. And God, I pray for maybe some of us in here that have forgotten about that place, that have forgotten about who you are. I pray that we would return to you. And God, we would begin to follow up on who we are and the life that you've given us that we would build that foundation again and we would step into that fullness again. And Father, I pray that we would celebrate it from the finished work of what you've done in our lives and that we would stop trying to work so hard for things that you've already given us. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed in this place, I just want to have a moment of invitation for you to maybe trust God again so maybe for the first time in your life, say yes to Jesus again. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm gonna ask you just for an outward sign of maybe what God's doing on the inside. Maybe God has spoken to you today. Maybe the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart. And he's saying, hey, it's time to do this. Here's your next step. That step may be as significant as stepping in to a relationship with Jesus and saying yes to him. Or maybe today that step is simply making one of those things a priority again. To continue to follow and build the foundation and be filled and understand the finished work and overflow with thankfulness in our life. Maybe God's spoken to you today and I just wanna pray for you. So when I count to three, if 
anything from saying yes to Jesus or taking that next step in your faith journey. Whatever it may be, you know, and the Holy Spirit is showing it to you right now. I want you to know you're not alone and your church is rallying around you. From a place of love, I want to pray for you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, you'd say, you know what, Ryan? God's showing me something today. Would you pray with me? Would you pray with me? Would you pray for me? When I count to three, would you just raise your hand if that's you today? One, two, three. If there's anyone here, yes, I see your hand and I see yours and I see yours. I count to three one more time. One, two, three. It's so good. Yes, I see your hand. I'm gonna pray for all of us here today, for those of us that raised their hand. And if you're saying yes to Jesus today, would you just, from your seat, just pray your own prayer of Jesus come into my life. I need you. But God, I pray for everyone here at Local City Church this morning and those watching online. Father, I pray today that you would fill them. And just like we said from this verse in Colossians, God, that we've been raised to new life because of Jesus. That the old is gone and the new has come. And Father, I pray that they would know that their past shame and hurt and sin and mistakes, it was all buried in the grave. And when you walked out alive and conquered sin and death, God, we have new life in you. And it's been a promise. We are made alive. We are raised with Jesus. And today we say yes to that. God, I pray that you would make those steps very clear to us and you would give the courage, give us the courage and strength to make them happen. Lord, we love you. We know we can't do this without you. We thank you that Jesus will always be more than enough. So thankful for our church and the people here today. Bless us as we go, God, and be with us. Help us always remember the place of love in Jesus. It's always about him. It will always be about him. He will never leave us or forsake us or forget about us. He is with us today. We love you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we all pray.